First off, we'll paste our data into Excel. You're gonna do that by clicking on cell A2 and hitting uh, Control V, or you can do it with a right click. Uh, in this example, I've already copied some data from Logger Pro. Uh, thankfully, the data is nicely separated into columns when it's copied direct from Logger Pro or another Excel sheet. Um, unfortunately, the column labels don't carry through when pasted, so we'll have to put those in manually. And from Logger Pro, the first, second, third, and fourth columns corresponded to time, position, velocity, and acceleration. You're just going to clean that up a little bit, uh, center everything, and uh, bold the first row. If you want to change that 2 into an exponent, uh, just select it, hit Control 1, click Superscript, and OK. So next we're going to insert our graph. We'll do this by selecting the data, uh, just the numbers, and along the top of the window in the Insert tab, click Scatter and select the first option. And there's our graph, uh, but it's currently displaying position, velocity, and acceleration all at once. I just want a position time graph for now. So what we're gonna do is right click anywhere on the grid and select data. Uh, we need to get rid of series two, which in this example is velocity, and we also need to get rid of series three, which in this case is acceleration. Uh, so now we just have a position time graph, but it flattens out at three seconds because I ran out of space to run in the class. Uh, so to make my analysis easier, I'm only going to graph my motion from zero to three seconds. So I'm just going to reselect the data uh, from zero to three seconds and make a plot that way. Uh, now normally I wouldn't omit data in an experiment, especially if I was trying to measure some fundamental constant like the speed of light or the acceleration due to gravity. Uh, but it's okay here because I'm just tracking my motion for an arbitrary length of time. Um, as before, I'm going to get rid of the velocity and acceleration data because I just want to do a position time graph. And because we don't have any other data here, we can get rid of our legend. Next up, we'll put in our axis labels. So under the layout tab for axis titles and the primary horizontal title, we'll do a title below the axis and the vertical title, we'll do a rotated title. Now the independent variable here is time, and we'll include the uncertainty in these measurements explicitly in the axis title by inserting the plus or minus symbol. Um, if this symbol wasn't used recently, you'll have to do a bit of searching here, but it is in the menu somewhere. I'm just gonna copy this plus or minus symbol because I'm gonna use it in a moment. And looking at the first column, all the time measurements are recorded to the nearest hundredth of a second, so that's what we'll record in our title. And the dependent variable here is position, and we'll include that uncertainty in the axis title. Make sure when you're typing this first not to include any spaces because Excel does some strange formatting if you do. Uh, looking at the second column, all the position measurements are recorded to the nearest tenth of a micrometer. So that's what we'll record here. And if you're wanting to do that in scientific notation, the Control-1 keyboard shortcut makes our lives a bit simpler. And we'll just finish off by inserting any spaces we left out when we first typed it. Now if you have any issue with the numbered increments on either your horizontal or vertical axis, you can adjust them under the Layout tab by hitting More Axis Options. Here you can specify the minimum, maximum, and increment size. Uh, in this case we'll try going from 0 to 3 seconds in quarter second increments, just to see what it'll look like. Um, in this example I don't really think this will be an improvement over the original, uh, but at least you can see how to change it if you need. Next up, we'll change the data points in our graph since the default ones are a bit big. So what you do is right click on any point, click Format Data Series, and along the left, click Marker Options. We'll change the type to the circle and change the size to the smallest available. In order to include error bars in our graph, we'll start by inserting a couple of columns next to our time measurements to set up our horizontal error bars. We'll call the first column Time Uncertainty and the second column Time Uncertainty Half. The reason for this second column should become clear in a moment. Just resize those columns. The uncertainty in our time measurements is a constant tenth of a second in this experiment, so we'll fill that first column accordingly. Now Excel does the error above and below each data point separately, so we'll need to split our total error in half in the second column. We can do this with a general equation, and when we fill this column, each row is calculated for us based on their input values to the left. So we'll do the same now with our position measurements to set up our vertical error bars. 
naming the first column position uncertainty and the second position uncertainty half. So I'll just resize those. Now the error in position is one tenth of a micrometer, so we'll fill that column with that value. Now we'll fill our second column using an equation based off of the first column values. And once we fill that one, we can insert error bars into our position time graph. So let's do that now. Click on the graph you're working on, and under the Layout tab, click Error Bars and select More Error Bars Options. You're going to select Custom and Specify Value. Click on the red arrow for the positive error values. Now click and drag your half uncertainties in position. Now do the same for negative error values. Double click on one of the horizontal error bars and we do the same procedure again. This is where we see Excel referencing the error above and below each data point separately. So this is why we needed to specify half errors earlier. So that's the error bars done. They're pretty small in this example, but they'll typically be larger and look something like this. Next, we're going to add a trend line to our graph. Under the trend line drop down menu, select more trend line options. And now we have our pick from a few different trend types. In many experiments, it's usually best to linearize our data and then graph it in order to fit a linear trend onto our graph. We obviously didn't do that in this example because we weren't trying to measure some fundamental constant. So we'll pick a second order polynomial here as that looks like a pretty good fit. You can display the equation and R squared value on your graph. The R squared value just tells you how well the trend line fits your data. Finally, it's a good idea to include a title for your graph somewhere. If you want to put the title above your graph, here's how to accomplish that in Excel. In scientific papers and textbooks, however, you'll probably notice the preferred position is actually below the graph in a figure label, along with a brief description like this one. Now, you probably won't end up using Excel a lot in the distant future if you start writing textbooks or scientific papers, but you should find this video helpful in the meantime.